We on, Todd? We are, yes. Sorry. Good morning. You, you caught all that, I'm sure. Good morning, everyone. We're fighting a few gremlins here this morning, so bear with us. But it's great to see you. Welcome to the Unitarian Universalist Church of Spokane, where our mission is to join together to create a nourishing liberal religious home and to champion justice, diversity, and environmental stewardship in our wider world. Or as we say in short, to find meaning. No, I, I messed it up. Create community, find meaning, and work for justice. Sorry, I had it right, just wrong order. As I say, we're fighting gremlins, and they've got my mind in different places today. Uh, <laughs> so welcome to everyone. We're, we're, we're so glad to have you here at the Unitarian Universalist Church this morning via our live stream. Glad you could be with us. I welcome all that you bring with you, as always, all of your uniqueness, your unique beliefs, background, lifestyle, experiences, your differences, all that helps make you who you are. And this, of course, includes those who are joining us um, as usual this morning, as well as those who might be joining us for the first time. We're so glad to have you. I want to welcome those who are in the room with us today, including Michalina, our pianist, who is going to be playing for us today. Todd Milney, who got us started off once again with his extraordinary music and talent, uh, working our audiovisual. Thank you so much, Todd. And Sonny Cook is actually here. Sonny came in to run our slideshow, but that's one of the gremlins that uh, <laughs> has gotten in the way. They, they're, they're not allowing our, our laptop to function very well this morning, so we're going to skip those slides. But Sonny is actually going to stick around and light our chalice and our candles of care for us when the time comes, because our lay leader, uh, our board president, uh, Richard Steele, was going to be here, but he uh, was unable to make it. Uh, after all, nevertheless, he picked out some very nice readings for us this morning and shared those with me, so I'm going to read those on behalf of uh, Richard Steele, and, and uh, we'll look forward to having him as a lay leader another time. So, uh, let's see, what else do I want to say? Yeah, oh yeah, Deb is Deb Jackman, our music director, is also not here today. Uh, she's under the weather, and we don't want to take any chances, so she's staying home. So we'll be uh, hoping the best for Deb. She gets well very soon. I did want to uh, uh, mention the church auction. Uh, online auction is going very well, thanks to everybody who's contributed to that, as well as those who have been bidding on some of the selections. We've already exceeded our, our, our rather conservative goal, thanks to you, and we've still got several weeks left to bid, so uh, please continue to go online and, and uh, make a bid on some of those auction items, and again, thanks to everyone who has um, helped make this uh, a successful and important fundraising opportunity for us uh, in, in what should be a difficult time, but uh, thanks so much for pulling it all together. Also wanted to mention, uh, for those who haven't heard, uh, our joint service featuring Urshad Manji last Sunday had a pretty big hiccup in it, and that was that there was apparently a, an unexpected limitation on the number of people that could participate. So I apologize for that if you were one of those who tried to get in and were unable. Uh, Fortunately, that 90-minute service, which is well worth watching and attending, in fact, if you did attend, uh, you, you may want to watch it again. Uh, it, is, it is online on YouTube. It has closed captioning, uh, which is helpful for some as well. And you can access that right off of our, right off of our church website at uuspokane.org. So I would encourage you to, to watch if you were unable to make it. And again, apologize for the inconvenience last Sunday. Okay, that is all I have right now. Let's take a few moments to greet one another. I'll take a moment to catch my breath, and uh, please do say hi to someone you're, you're, you're missing, someone you're wanting to let them know you're thinking of them via text, email, uh, phone call, whatever it might be.
Okay, thank you so much. And as always, I hope you'll continue to stay in touch as you're able to throughout with one another throughout the week. We are now going to move forward with our service by lighting our chalice, the symbol of our faith, the symbol of our unity and our solidarity, of our openness and our inclusion of our community and our individual uniqueness. May this small flame be our offering of warmth to those who are cold and alone and a light to those in darkness. May it be a flame that ignites justice in our world and a beacon of hope to those in need. And may it reflect at least a spark of truth wherever truth has been lost and cast a healthy shadow of doubt wherever it's been found. For our opening words, and thanks again to Dick Steele for these words from Viktor Frankl's book, Man's Search for Meaning. No one can become fully aware of the very essence of another human being unless he loves them. By his love he is enabled to see the essential traits and features in the beloved person, and even more, he sees that which is potential in him, which is not yet actualized, but yet ought to be actualized. Furthermore, by his love, the loving person enables the beloved person to actualize these potentialities. By making him aware of what he can be and what he should become, he makes these potentialities come true. That is just about my sermon in a nutshell. Thank you so much. As I said, Dick is a very thoughtful, uh, very thoughtful lay leader, and he thinks deeply about the brief words that he shares with us during our services. We are now going to kindle our candles of care for those who are most on our hearts and minds this morning. And we're going to begin with a candle for church member Dina Romoff, who is currently hospitalized with COVID-19. She's asked us to keep her in our thoughts and prayers. Also a candle for church member Phoebe Daniels, whose brother Harold passed away on October 8th. I don't have any other specific requests for candles, but I know that this is a a big week, um, an anxious week for all of us coming up in just a couple of days. So I'm kindling a candle for uh, our country, for our world, but also for this church community and for all the people uh, in it that I care and care for and love because I know there's a, a level of anxiety in all of us right now. So I'm thinking of you. Let's take a moment of silence on behalf of others, and you're welcome to name them aloud at home at this time if you'd like. Thank you. Those named aloud and those embraced in our silence and all those who are suffering in our world at this hour, we hold in our community with compassion. We do have a special collection uh, this month. Actually, our, our special collection that today would have been for October, uh, but since we weren't live uh, the past two weeks, we're having it today and we'll have another toward the end of the month. These are opportunities to contribute to our community uh, that our Social Justice Coordinating Council uh, organizes for us. And uh, this special collection is for the fire victims in the Colville Tribe area. The fires uh, that we had this summer burned many homes in the Colville Tribal lands, 
Many families are still not in permanent housing. Rentals are very hard to find, and families are looking uh, for places to live that are on the land or near the land where they have livestock they have to care for, uh, possibly even looking for mobile homes or RVs, if anyone, anybody can help in that way. Four of these families uh, include single fathers with children who have livestock outside of town. Funds are needed to buy these types of permanent homes and to install them. And if you'd like to contribute to this, you can mail a check and just include special collection and the date 10-18-2020. Uh, That's 10-18-2020. That's when we were supposed to have uh, this in the memo line. Uh, and mail that to our church office, or you can donate it online uh, more easily on our website. Uh, you don't have to sign in, just include again 10-18-2020 in the special collection date field uh, of the form in the general donation payments section. So thanks in advance for your generosity and for your compassion. All right, I am now going to have our story for all ages. And I brought quite a menagerie to help me with the story today. I'm going to kind of tell a story. This is a story that I actually did some time ago, a version of it anyway, but I kind of did it off the cuff. And I liked it so much, I finally got around to writing it down into a proper story form. And so I'm going to tell it again. Hopefully you don't remember it and won't fall asleep. <laughs> yes. All right, let's see. I'm going to be doing a hand dance here, so you're just going to have to tolerate it. Okay, so, uh, once upon a time, there was a very lonely hedgehog named Harriet. Harriet the Hedgehog. Harriet was lonely because she had no friends. Most of the other creatures that she met thought that she was just a bit too prickly. But Harriet never stopped trying and tried her best to be as friendly as she could to everybody she met. One day while she was about her day, she met a baby bird. Hello, said the baby bird. Hello, Harriet replied. Would you like to be my friend, baby bird said. I would love to be your friend, Harriet smiled. It's settled then, said baby bird. How about a hug? Harriet knew what would happen next, but she didn't want to be unfriendly. Just as soon as they hugged, Baby Bird shrieked, Ouch! I could never be friends with someone who was so prickly. And off Baby Bird flew away. All right. Harriet felt sad because she lost her new friend so soon, but she was used to it. Not long afterward, though, she encountered a friendly mouse. Hello, said Mouse. Hello, Harriet replied. Would you like to be my friend? Said Mouse. I would love to be your friend, Harriet smiled. It's settled then, said Mouse. How about a hug? Harriet knew exactly what would happen next, but she didn't want to be unfriendly. And just as soon as they hugged, Mouse shrieked, Ouch! I could never be friends with someone who is so prickly. And off Mouse scurried away. Harriet felt sad to lose her new friend so soon, but she was used to it. Not long afterward, while drinking from a nearby river, 
she encountered a very friendly frog. Hello, said Frog. Hello, Harriet replied. Would you like to be my friend, said Frog. I would love to be your friend, said Harriet. It's settled then, said Frog. How about a hug? Harriet knew what would happen next, but she didn't want to be unfriendly. Just as soon as they hugged, Frog shrieked, Ouch! I could never be friends with someone who is so prickly. And into the river, Frog leaped away. Meanwhile, near the very bottom of the river, bear with me. There we go. All right. Meanwhile, by the, near the very bottom of that same river, lived a lonely hermit crab named Hermie. Or Herman, I should say. Herman the Hermit Crab. And Herman was very lonely because he had no friends. Most of the other creatures he met thought that he was a bit too crusty. But Herman never stopped trying and tried to be as friendly he, he, as he could to everyone he met. One day while he was going about his day, he met a salmon. Hello, said the salmon. Hello, Hermit replied. Would you like to be my friend? Salmon said. I would love to be your friend, Herman smiled. It's settled then, said Salmon. Let's shake on it. Herman knew what would happen next. But he didn't want to be unfriendly. Just as soon as they shook on it, Salmon shrieked, Ouch! I could never be friends with somebody who is so crusty. And off Salmon swam away. Herman felt sad to lose his new friend so soon, but he was used to it. Not long afterward, he encountered a very friendly clownfish. Hello, clownfish said. Hello, Herman replied. Would you like to be my friend, said clownfish. I would love to be your friend, Herman said, and he smiled. It's settled then, said clownfish. Let's shake on it. Herman knew what would happen next, but he didn't want to be unfriendly. Just as soon as they shook, Clownfish shrieked, Ouch! I could never be friends with someone who's so crusty and off. Clownfish spun away. Herman felt sad to lose his new friend so soon, but he was used to it. Not long afterward, while floating toward the surface for a breath of fresh air, he encountered a friendly frog. Hello, said Frog. Hello, said Herman. Would you like to be my friend, said Frog. I would love to be your friend, Herman smiled. It's settled then, said Frog. Let's shake on it. Herman knew exactly what would happen next, but he didn't want to be unfriendly. Just as soon as they shook, Frog shrieked, ouch! I could never be friends with someone who is so crusty. And up onto the lily pad, he leaped. Just then, Hermit heard, Herman heard a terrible commotion. When he turned his head, he saw a little hedgehog had fallen into the water who obviously couldn't swim. None of the other animals would rescue her, not frog or clownfish or salmon, because she was too prickly. Then, without giving it a thought, Herman rushed to save Harriet, grabbed her with his claws, and dragged her out of the water to safety. Thank you, said Harriet. You're welcome, Herman said. Then, without giving it any thought, Harriet hugged Herman. Oh my, she said, I hope I didn't hurt you. Not at all, Herman said. I hope I didn't hurt you when I grabbed you. Not at all, Harriet said. Would you like to be my friend? They both said at once. I would love to be your friend, they both said giggling. Let's shake on it, said Herman. How about a hug, 
said Harriet. For everyone there is someone. Okay, we are now going to take a moment for meditation. And uh, again, these are the words from that Dick Steele selected today for our meditation. Um, you're welcome to close your eyes, settle in for in whichever way you like to meditate, even if it's just to take a few deep breaths. These are the words, and I hope I get this correct. Ephrat Sibokowitz. Sibokowitz, probably. So Dick can correct me on that when he sees me. But this is a beautiful sentiment. Every child regardless of age or condition, should have three things. Nature as a playground, a dog, and a mother willing to let her child enjoy them all. And for our reading today, I think you'll recognize that where this comes from. If I speak in the tongues of mortals and angels but do not have love, I am a noisy gong or clanging cymbal. And if I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and knowledge, and if I have faith so as to remove mountains but do not have love, I'm nothing. If I give away all my possessions, and if I hand over my body to be burned, but do not have love, I gain nothing. Love is patient, love is kind, love is not envious, or boastful, or arrogant, or rude. It does not insist on its own way, it is not irritable or resentful, it does not rejoice in wrongdoing, but rejoices in the truth. It bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never ends. Prophecies will come to an end. Tongues will cease. Knowledge will come to an end. We know in part, we prophesy in part, but when the complete comes, the partial will come to an end. When I was a child, I spoke like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. When I became an adult, I put an end to childish ways. Now we see in a mirror, in a riddle. Then we will see face to face. Now I know in part, then I will know fully. Now faith, hope, and love abide. These three, and the greatest of these, is love.
Thank you, Michalina. That was autumn leaves. And it, it makes me just a little more, just a little more appreciative of the leaves I raked up all weekend. <laughs> Not much, though. My back and my shoulder aren't as appreciative as my heart is, but thank you, beautiful music. Okay, I'm getting all my different papers in order here. Sorry, folks. I'm also going to ask my friends to maybe take a swim in the bottom of the river here. So my, the title of my sermon today, in case you missed it, is A Kingdom of Ends. A Kingdom of Ends. Toward a society in which all people flourish. Unitarianism is defined by its belief that Jesus was only human. Uh, it has a humanistic Christology, that is. And this is why it has historically de-emphasized the miraculous and supernatural stories ascribed to him. If Unitarians believe in God, it was the one God Jesus believed in. But they did not believe in a triune Godhead that included Christ. Those who officially founded Unitarianism in Eastern Europe were and remain Christians, even though they don't believe in the Trinity. To them, Jesus should be revered for his humanitarian teachings, which still have practical meaning for us today. One of the things Jesus is said to have spoken about often is establishing the kingdom of heaven here on earth. Unlike popular Christianity, which considers him a deity who died for our sins so we can be forgiven and given entrance to a heavenly kingdom after we die, Jesus talked about creating abundant life right here, right now, for everyone on earth by ever broadening our communities, embracing those who have been diminished, demeaned, and demonized. The outcast, the sinner, the foreigner, the immigrant, the stranger, non-believers, women, children, and even those who have helped uphold unjust and oppressive systems in order to get by. For Jesus to err was human, and so was forgiveness. Forgiveness wasn't a golden ticket to a heavenly theme park, but an ordinary human power to help establish a more peaceful and just society amongst ourselves. The kingdom of God is not coming with signs to be observed, he said, nor will they say, look, here it is, or there, for behold, the kingdom of God is in the midst of you. I imagine states, statements like these were as astonishing to those who first heard them 2,000 years ago as they are to those who grasp their meaning, meaning today, 2,000 years later. Today, most consider the kingdom of God an ethereal place of riches, peace, and beauty that we can only enjoy in the afterlife, a kind of reward for all the misery that we endure in this life. Back then, those Jesus was speaking to didn't believe in an afterlife and placed all their hope in believing that the kingdom of God would be established on earth so they could be relieved of their suffering and oppression in the present. But they were hoping for an egalitarian society in which, I should say, they weren't hoping for an egalitarian society in which everyone is included and gets along, but for a society in which they were on top, in which the God of Abraham and King David would miraculously defeat the Roman Empire and reestablish Israel to the mythical glory depicted of in the Hebrew Scriptures. Then Jesus comes along and implies that it's neither a better place in the afterlife, for those of us around today, nor a place that 
God will suddenly establish with miraculous signs and wonders, nor the triumphant sounds of angelic bugles, but a place that is already here, right now among us, even though most of us don't recognize it. Behold, the kingdom of God is in the midst of you. I take this to mean this is it. If we want to experience the best kind of world imaginable, then it's not up to God. It's up to us. It is only in the midst of you, among us, that it can emerge. American Unitarians may or may not consider ourselves Christians, but we still believe Jesus was a human being and we still embrace his humanitarian theology. That whatever we believe about God, whether we're a Christian, a Muslim, Hindu, Buddhist, Rastafarian, or a Muni, it's up to us to incarnate our most sacred values here on earth by working to make the world a more just, peaceful, and beautiful place for everyone. Everyone. That sounds simple enough, but how do we build such a community? which has been longed for and dreamt of since the dawn of human history, yet has also evaded human society ever since. I would answer by suggesting that we do so by listening to what Jesus tried to say two millennium ago. Stop expecting miracles and divine intervention and stop waiting until it's too late. Heaven on earth won't fall from the sky on the wings of angels, nor be granted to us after we're dead. If we want it, we have to embrace the humanistic ethic at the heart of Jesus' teachings, and that is also at the heart of all religions and all moral beliefs. Whatever our theology, whether we are believers or atheists, or call it God or simply our greatest values, it cannot magically present itself. All beliefs are incarnated through human behavior. But our most lofty, be they our most lofty aspirations or our most dismal. The kingdom of God is in the midst of you. I think Jesus also correctly understood the formula for establishing such a society is, as summarized in his brief statements, love one another and love your neighbor as yourself. But as emotionally intelligent beings, we have to admit that we can't maintain positive feelings about everyone all of the time. If such a society must be based upon our random and spontaneous sentiments and emotions, we can forget about it. But love isn't an emotion. Love isn't a feeling. Did you know psychologists don't list love as a primary emotion? Not even as a secondary one. Love, rather, is behavioral. It's something we can do with no feeling at all. And for people we don't even know and will never meet, simply by working to create a world that promises the welfare of all people, and the flourishing of every person. Eric Fromm said, the way one looks at one's neighbor or talks to a child, the way one eats, walks, or shakes hands, or the way in which a group behaves toward minorities is more expressive of faith and love than any stated belief. Fromm also said, Love is an activity characterized by its lack of exclusiveness. If I truly love one person, I love all persons. I love the world. I love life. That's why the kingdom of heaven on earth can't just belong to one chosen people at the expense of everyone else. It can't belong to just one country either. It can't be exclusively about making America great again. Not if this is a Christian nation. 
it can't be about making America great again, because that's not Christian. Or returning any nation to some previously imagined state of glory. The kingdom of heaven on earth must be about creating an abundant life for all the children of the world. This is so because the loving behavior, the love expressed as an activity, is rooted in the humanistic ethic which emphasizes human welfare and individual unfolding. Materially, Fromm said, it is based on the principle that what is good is what is good for humanity and what is evil is what is detrimental to humanity. And by the way, damaging our planet in our environment, and the creatures we share it with, is harmful to humanity, which is what makes it an evil. It's not an anthropocentric morality, not the humanistic ethic. As you've heard me often repeat, the sole criterion of ethical value according to his explanation of the humanistic ethic is human welfare and the unfolding and growth of every person must be the aim of all social and political activities. Everything we do as a society must be about human welfare and individual unfolding, individual flourishing, individual eudaimonia. For love is the active concern for the life and the growth of that which we love. Love is the active concern for the life and the growth of that which we love. Fromm, one of the most influential thinkers in my life, wasn't the only one to interpret love through this humanistic ethic. As I've already argued, there's good reason to be believe Jesus thought the same thing, though he may, may have said it differently. It has also long been the Unitarian idea of love, rooted in its humanistic Christology, dating at least as far back as the 16th century Eastern Europe, but in my interpretation of our history, all the way back to the first Christians, American Unitarianism emerged somewhat independently, however, of our Eastern Europe European counterparts. Out of the Enlightenment values, rediscovered during the Renaissance, rooted in classical Greek antiquity. In America, our religion was originally called Arminianism, based upon the belief in human goodness, based upon the radical idea of human goodness, contrary to the doctrine of original sin. As I explain in the Gadfly papers, the disbelief in human depravity was expressed by the Unitarian minister John G Haynes Holmes, who was also ousted as a heretic, whom again, an early advocate of the social gospel, believed religion should concentrate on human welfare and agency, not upon the supernatural and the miraculous. In the early 1900s, Universalist minister Clarence Skinner, one of Holmes' younger associates, also began emphasizing the social gospel and with it a positive view of human nature. Skinner penned a declaration of social principles and social program adopted by the Univers Universalist General Convention in 1917 that explicitly rejected the idea of inherent depravity, claiming instead that mankind is led into sin by evil surroundings, by the evils of unjust social and economic systems. And it went on to call for the basic right to own land, equal rights for women, freedom of speech, some form of social security for everyone, and a global government guaranteeing these same rights for everyone everywhere. That's our roots. That's what we're about. That's what we're supposed to be about. And that's starting to sound a lot like the kingdom of heaven on earth, what it should look like. And it's based on the humanistic ethics, understanding that a love 
of, uh, that, that love is lacking exclusion. Or conversely, it is the inclusion of all humankind. That's what love is. And this doesn't merely mean every person is accepted regardless of their arbitrary identities like gender, color, religion, politics, sexuality, or whether or not they're a Seahawks fan. All of which is important except perhaps the part about being a Seahawks fan. It also means a society in which every person, every human being on the planet has what they need to live a dignified and happy life, including access to healthy food, to clean water and air, adequate housing, quality education, affordable health care, and public safety and security. A society in which this isn't so, in which these basic necessities are treated as privileges, reserved only for those who can afford them or are considered more deserving than others, is an inhuman society. A society that doesn't provide all these things. Even if it's because its, its economy doesn't succeed in leading to these things, is an inhuman society because it does not practice the humanistic ethic requiring that human welfare and the unfolding and growth of every person is the aim of all our social and political activities. If, if this is not the world we live in, if this is not the world we've created, then it is a failure. Which is why we need to work to establish such a society. And to do so, there is another mindset that we must adopt. The moral belief that no person should be used for another's gain. That's what's holding us back. No person should be used for another's gain. In his book, The Sane Society, Fromm says that when this kind of human solidarity breaks down or is absent, a living human being comes to be an end in oneself and becomes the, I'm sorry, a living human being ceases to be an end in oneself and becomes the means for the economic interest of another person or oneself or of an impersonal giant, the economic machine. But Fromm wasn't the first to put the matter in these terms. He attributes it, he says, to Kant, who with regard to the idea that man should be an end in himself and never a means only, was perhaps the most influential ethical thinker of the Enlightenment period. Even if you're not into philosophy, you've probably heard of Immanuel Kant's categorical imperative, which was at the heart of his moral philosophy and is his term for a moral duty that is binding in all circumstances. A categorical imperative that is binding in all circumstances. There's no excuse not to adhere to it, if he's right. And here, Kant sounds to me a bit like the crusty trail boss in the movie City Slickers. Remember that? When defining the meaning of life, he holds up his index finger and says, one thing, just one thing. You stick to that and everything else don't mean diddly squat. Except he didn't say diddly squat. <laughs> In the movie, that wise old cowboy says that figuring out what the one thing is, is up to each one of us. But for Kant, it's the same for all of us. Humanities professor A.C. Grayling, Grayling summarizes it best. The most famous formulation of the categorical imperative is act in such a way that you always treat humanity, whether in your own person or in the person of any other, never simply as a means, 
but always at the same time as an end. Kant thinks of the moral community of persons as a kingdom of ends, a mutual association of free beings in which every individual seeks to realize freely chosen goals. Every individual seeks to realize freely chosen goals compatible, compatible with the freedom of everyone else to do likewise. I'm going to read that part one more time. Kant thinks of the moral community of persons as a kingdom of ends, a mutual association of free beings in which every individual seeks to realize freely chosen goals compatible with the freedom of everyone else to do likewise. That's what the kingdom of heaven on earth looks like. It is a kingdom of ends in which individual autonomy reigns supreme and is respected by all, meaning that we don't base our freedoms on the subjugations of others. It is a humanistic principle that was first articulated in the age of antiquity, rediscovered during the Renaissance, and became a vision of, for society that flourished for a time during the Enlightenment. And this is why this categorical principle, this one thing should be our priority as Unitarian Universalists because ours is an Enlightenment religion that was born in the U.S. in devotion to this very principle. Though it has even more ancient roots in antiquity in the, in the humanistic teachings of a man named Jesus. This imperative is why we're all here today. because it epitomizes the purpose of our religion and of our vision for what our society must become as articulated these days in the one principle, the one principle, the, the first of seven that we can all actually remember, the worth and dignity of every person. Thank you. Again, Deb is not here to lead us in, in song, but uh, Michalina is going to go ahead and play the music to the hymn number 305, uh, De Colores, All the Colors. And if you have the words or know the song, you're welcome to sing them at home, but we're going to, uh, to listen as we ponder our service this morning. Thank you, Michalina. For our benediction, Dick has chosen for us the words of Audrey Hepburn. Hep Hepburn, I should say. A beloved actress and humanitarian activist. People, even more than things, have to be restored, renewed, revived, reclaimed, and redeemed. Never throw out anyone. Amen. <laughs>